Um, all right, so with our kind of our, our culminating lecture behind us, right, our, um, our lecture on uh, model building, how to kind of build the quote perfect statistical model, um, kind of how to go about doing that, there's really not a whole lot left for this class other than practice, right? So you have labs, you have homework, you have a take home test, you have an eventual final exam. At this point, we've really covered like the core material of the class. Realistically, there's two weeks of lecture left. One of those weeks we're starting now. This week's lecture is on this idea of confounding. Confounding is kind of this side topic. It's, it's not essential, it's not crucial, it's maybe not part of the core, but it is a pretty important idea. And because of that, it's something we wanna talk about. And then we'll talk about a statistical technique called ANCOVA which is short for analysis of covariance. And, and we'll kind of see how that helps address the problem of confounding that we're gonna talk about right now. So this week's lecture is broken into two parts, a confounding part and an ANCOVA part. Next week's lecture, which I believe will be uh, delivered via distance, uh, by the great Professor Rieger is going to be about a statistical technique called ANOVA. That's technically actually just starting to set the groundwork for STAT 513, which you'll hopefully be taking uh, next fall semester with the great Professor Gallup. So with all of that behind us, let's talk about this kind of interesting idea or concept called confounding. So before we talk about confounding, I want to talk about the idea that when you build a regression model, you could be doing so with one of two goals in mind. Sometimes you have both of the goals in mind, but often you're, you're focused on just sort of one of these two. Um, one of those goals might be prediction. You want to predict a dependent variable based on a set of independent variables. And so in this case, we are trying to find a model that fits right, observed data, but also predicts future data. So a lot of business related, a lot of business um, applications of statistics, uh, banking, finance, economics, um, tend to be focused on prediction. And when you're focused on prediction, things like, um, like uh, validating your model, assessing reliability, which we talked about last class, become like really important. However, right, the second, the second goal of statistics is to quantify the relationship of one or more independent variables to a dependent variable. In this case, we are trying to produce accurate estimates for one or more of the regression coefficients in our model. This is done a lot um, it's used a lot like in epidemiology, for example, um, public health settings, even just like medical settings, right? In medical settings, we're often interested in trying to like quantify relationships. Like, so maybe we want to like look at um, whether or not someone um, is cured of a disease. And maybe we want to look at like two different like health, uh, two different maybe age groups and see whether not just whether one age group is more or less likely to say get a disease or be cured of a disease, but how much more likely, right? So in situations like that, we're basically looking at coefficients in our model. And, and our goal then is to get the coefficients of those model to be as accurate as possible. Now, today's lecture and our discussion of confounding is really focusing on that second bullet point because confounding is something that happens that kind of that kind of messes up the coefficients. And so, right, we want to be aware of confounding. We want to address confounding anytime we have the goal of trying to get accurate estimates. So yeah, so that first bullet point, really a lot of our class is focused on that. Um, again, right, the, a lot of business things are interested in like forecasting, forecasting, maybe like return on investment given a certain number of investments. Um, forecasting, um, right, maybe what GDP might be next year um, given, right, maybe this year's GDP, things like that.
And second type, I mean, I already gave us a bunch of examples, but right here's another one. Maybe you want to quantify how sugar intake affects sleep. It's not just whether or not it does, right? That's just a significance test, but right, exactly how much, right? For every one unit of sugar, we could expect our amount of sleep to, I guess, presumably decrease by this amount, for example. Now, as I said, it's the second situation that we're going to talk about today, and that's what we're confounding as sort of most relevant. So, so what is confounding? Confounding occurs when we are only interested in the relationship between y and me in one, maybe two variables of primary interest. But it turns out to accurately assess this relationship, we need to account for, and sometimes it's referred to as control for or adjust for, other variables. These other variables might be referred to as extraneous variables. They might be referred to as control variables. They are very often referred to as covariates. So here I think is like a nice example to kind of illustrate what we're talking about. I actually think maybe we started this class out with like at least a brief discussion of this example. So imagine a situation we're interested in um, in studying uh, whether or not a vegetarian diet impacts heart health. And I guess, right, maybe even more so to what extent it impacts heart health, right? Maybe vegetarians are less likely to have a heart attack. How much less likely, right? So we want to know not just yes or no, but we want to quantify it. And that requires, right, accurate assessment of model coefficients. Now, this type of study would be observational rather than experimental. An experimental study is like a clinical study, a clinical trial where right, you randomly assign people to either take medicine A or medicine B. We probably could not do that in this case, right? We probably couldn't get a thousand people randomly assign half of them to be vegetarians for the rest of their life and randomly assign right the remaining 500 to be um, to be carnivores for the rest of their lives it's probably not going to work agreed so we're stuck with an observational study that is we have to enlist some people that have already made the choice to be vegetarians and we have to enlist some people who have already made the choice to be carnivores and we have to follow them over time and right see what happens to their heart now observational studies have certain um certain potential flaws associated with them certain weaknesses and and that is that our groups might differ in other fundamental ways so imagine that we do this and imagine we follow them over time and imagine that we observe that vegetarians do in fact have healthier hearts right a devil's advocate might say what a devil's advocate might say well hold on okay yeah your groups are different and the vegetarian group has healthier heart it does not necessarily mean that the absence of meat is what gave them the healthier heart. Why not? Well, it could be that the type of person who chooses a vegetarian diet also tends to be the type of person who chooses not to smoke. That is, it just happens to be, right, because we're looking at people that have made choices, right, maybe the vegetarian group smokes less than the non-vegetarian group, and that's why they have healthier hearts. It could be that maybe a vegetarian tends to exercise more than a non-vegetarian, and that's why they have healthier hearts. It could be that a vegetarian tends to have a healthier diet in, in, in other aspects. For example, maybe drinks less soda, maybe eats less junk food, and that's why they have healthier hearts. That is, there could be a whole slew of other reasons than just the absence of meat that might explain the difference between these two groups. All of these other variables, right? Smoking, exercise, other aspects of diet, these are potential confounders.
So yeah, so the implications are what? A naive study that looks only at diet might observe vegetarians have healthier hearts, but that observed difference could possibly have nothing to do with diet. It might do be due entirely to non-vegetarians uh, smoking more. And there you go. That's the idea of confounding. There's a problem. The problem is there's been confounding. The relationship is confounded by smoking. How do we fix this? Well, it turns out the fix is very simple. I mean, I say simple. That's assuming that you actually have the information um, at your disposal. Right? So statistically speaking, we can adjust for smoking simply by including it in our model. So that is we do just write a model statement that would say model heart, right? Our y variable is measuring some measurement of heart health equals diet. That's the variable we're interested in. And we just put in smoking. That becomes our covariate. And what that does is it will look at the relationship between diet <coughs> and heart health adjusting for smoking. And so our conclusion might read, assuming a significant p-value for diet, even after controlling for possible differences in smoking, we still observe that vegetarians tend to have healthier hearts. Now, I say it's simple. I mean, it is simple. It could hardly be more simple from like a statistician's perspective. But of course, like from a study design perspective, I mean, we have to have had the foresight to have recorded the information for our patients as to whether or not they smoked, even though, right, whether or not they smoked was not part of our main question. If we had not gathered that information, we would not be able to adjust for it. We'd be out of luck. So, I mean, there is a lot of extra complexity. It's just that extra complexity is at the very beginning of our study. We have to make sure we're cognizant of these confounding issues. We have to make sure we gather the appropriate data to address them. But assuming we have, doing the actual adjustment is as easy as just putting the variable in our model. Now, I'll, when, I, when we talk about this idea of adjusting for, controlling for, I know the term feels like a little bit pie in the sky. Um, like, well, what do you mean by controlling? What do we mean by adjusting? Um, kind of just kind of hang with me. <clears throat> I mean, I do think we have hopefully like an intuitive idea. It's kind of like, okay, so maybe there is differences in um, smoking between the two groups. The idea of adjusting is we just sort of we just sort of take those differences into account. I mean, that's conceptually what's happening. We kind of we kind of like wash that out of the picture. Now, what does that mean computationally? When we talk about ANCOVA, I think that'll become a little bit more transparent. But for now, let's just kind of think about it big picture. Now, we could actually extend this as much as we want. We can control for as many covariates as we like. So for example, if we also wanted to control for exercise habits, we could just write model heart equals diet smoking exercise. And our conclusion would now read, even after controlling for smoking and exercise, we still observe that vegetarians tend to have healthier hearts. All right, so we could put as many covariates into our model as we'd like. And as I've already said, such adjustments are common in fields that use observational studies. So confounding is most often a problem when we have these observational studies. So in epidemiology, we have them a lot. Sociology, we have them a lot. To be honest, in economics, we also have observational studies a lot. So confounding is something we want to be interested in a lot of economical studies. Although it's also worth considering even in experimental studies. Um, because confounding can help protect against a bad sample. So. How do I assess for confounding? Is there a way to actually see whether confounding is present or not present? We know how to control for it. That's a little bit of putting the, the cart before the horse, right? Because we're controlling for something that maybe doesn't even need to be controlled for. So how do we actually see if confounding is occurring? Well, 
the process looks like this. We first begin by running the model with just our primary variable of interest. And we look at that regression coefficient. Let's call this the crude estimate. We then run the model with our primary variable of interest and the variable or variables that we believe might be confounders. And we look at the new regression coefficient. We call this the adjusted coefficient or the adjusted estimate. If the crude estimate is meaningfully different, and we'll talk about what that, what that means in a little bit, then the adjusted estimate then we say confounding is present. Now, what is meaningfully different? How do you define something like that? How do you assess? Oh, this is meaningfully different. This is not meaningfully different. Well, that's generally recommended to not even be a statistical decision. Whenever possible, it's recommended to consult with an industry or subject specialist as to what constitutes a meaningful difference. That said, there are certainly times where we don't have access to such a specialist. There are certainly times where we ask the specialist and they just shrug and say, I don't know. And in those situations, a pretty common rule of thumb is to say confounding has occurred if that crude estimate changes by more than 10%. So let's sort of just do two examples, just kind of focusing on just the mechanics of assessing confounding. Um, that'll actually wrap up our confounding lecture, so relatively short, just focusing on what confounding is, how to adjust for it, and how to, how to see whether it's happening. We'll talk more about the adjustment process in the next set of PowerPoints on the analysis of covariance. So here's our first example. <laughs> Back, of course, to our beloved bears. And let's say that our, our research goal is to assess the relationship between the length of a bear and its weight. And we're worried that this relationship might be confounded by gender. So how would we see whether or not that's true? All right, so there's two proc regs, right? The first proc reg is, is is going to the weight equals length. That's going to give us our crude estimate. And then that, that weight equals length and gender is going to give us our adjusted estimate. So here's the output from the first proc reg. This is our crude estimate. Our crude estimate is 10.04. And then here's the model with our covariate gender in there. So now it's 9.8. So we had 10.04, we included gender, it changed a little bit to 9.8. Has there been confounding? Well, in practice, we would ask an expert if that's a meaningful difference, right? The difference between saying for every one unit increase in length, we expect weight to increase in 10 pounds, versus 9.8 pounds. I mean, I'd be tempted to say that's not that big a difference. Well, I take that back. Maybe, maybe by this point, maybe by this point, we're the bear experts. So maybe we can just ask ourselves. In the presence of such an expert, or perhaps in the presence of humility with respect to our own expertise, we would observe that this is a less than 10% change right? 10% of 10 is one. So it changed by less than one unit and say that confounding is not present. So this is an example where we would say that gender is not confounding the relationship between length and weight. Well, what if we wanted to see if the relationship is confounded by chest girth? Now, same idea. Right. We already know the crude estimate, right? That's never changing. That crude estimate is 10.04. So I need to look at the adjusted estimate using chest as a covariate. The adjusted estimate using chest as a covariate is 1.1. 1.1. Is confounding present? We went from 10 to 1. 
in practice, we would ask an expert if this is a meaningful difference, but that is like a like a 90% change, right? It's a dramatic reduction, very dramatic reduction from 10 to one. That's certainly much more than a 10% change. And because of that, right, in the absence of an expert, we would say that confounding is present. And so what we would want to do, if our goal is to really get the accurate thing, we would want to adjust for the confounding by keeping the chest in our model. And that's that, right? That's our discussion of confounding, what it is, the type of situations where it's most problematic, observational studies, how to assess whether it's there, comparing crude and adjusted estimates, and then how to control for it if it exists. Basically, just put that covariate, that confounder in your model. Now we're gonna talk more about what this adjustment process looks like in the next set of PowerPoints when we talk about this process called ANCOVA, which again is short for analysis of covariance.